Time now to take a look at what's making news in the papers this morning. And making headlines is Novak Djokovic's visa being cancelled by Australia's immigration minister. The Serbian tennis star's hopes of defending his Australian Open title are all but over as he's set to be deported from the country. To discuss this, I'm joined now by Studio 10 and 10 News First presenter Narelda Jacobs. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Dan and Joe. It's been, it's been the story that's dominating. Yes. Um, and look, I don't think they have brought the public with them on this decision I, because we've, we've all been through the two year pandemic together and we've reached the point now where it's not about what is being brought into the country to protect our borders uh, and make sure everybody is double vaxxed uh, and they're all ticking, you know, all the paperwork, doing that all correctly. It's about what's already here. And I think the public are feeling the longer this saga is dragging on, that it is just a diversionary tactic uh, by the Morrison government. Um, even though, you know, Scott Morrison himself is is washing his hands of it and saying, look, this is all Alex Hawke's decision now. Um, he's effectively throwing his minister on the, under the bus and trying to distance himself from this decision. But it's the entire government that's come to this decision together. Uh, look, I, are you guys over Novak Djokovic by now? <laughs> yes, oh, yes, we are, although it's not really the time to be over it, certainly for this weekend. But I, I think you're right in saying that, you know, you've got people on either side of the debate, Norelda, but then most people are just feeling that regardless of what you think, regardless of your opinion, it's the way it's played out mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, we're going to see another uh, fight in the courts. I mean, the Australian Open starts on Monday. Uh, let alone all the discussion overseas. I mean, how is this reflecting on Australia? It would be, you would understand if there were no COVID cases within Australia, but we're dealing with tens of thousands of cases every day now. Um, it, it's, it's a case of pick your battles. You know, when, when there are Australians who are giving birth to premature babies on their bathroom floor and can't get an ambulance to their home and they have to give um, CPR to their newborn baby in the back of a car, mm. uh, when you have mothers who can't buy meat to feed their family because supermarket shelves are empty, uh, because they can't buy two packs of sausages, but they've got a family of seven and they ha can't prove that they've got seven children at home. Um, when you've got people who can't buy rapid antigen mm. tests, you know, you can't, the, the decision uh, uh, on, you know, how to, that they've made on Novak Djokovic does not fly because it's not in the, it's not about public interest and, and the good health of, of the public when all of those things are happening within your country to Australian citizens. It just doesn't fly. Yeah, and, and we're certainly seeing that in, uh, well, the comments that are being made across the country, social media platforms and the like. Uh, Nerola Jack, I want to shift gears now and uh, look at COVID-19 in remote communities. You would have seen the news yesterday in the Northern Territory that that lockout for unvaccinated people was extended in the uh, remote communities in the NT of Yuendamu and Yolamu, uh, and also that there's still great concern about Amongana, which is just to the southeast of Alice Springs. But this is much broader than just those three communities, isn't it? Yes, and for, particularly for those communities, a lot of them are double vaxxed, which is which is fantastic. Um, but even though they are double vaxxed, they don't know what COVID is. Some of the people there, and they've been ringing trusted friends who are in cities like you know, Sydney and, and other, other places, to find out what COVID actually is and what symptoms to expect. They have an infection, they're positive cases, but they simply don't know what COVID is. The mind boggles that there are Australians uh, amongst us who are double vaxxed, who have been given the vaccination, but they don't know what they've been vaccinated for. They don't know what symptoms to look out for. And these sorts of uh, things are playing out, not just in remote communities as well, we're hearing uh, a, a lot of, um, you know, stories of people phoning up triple uh, zero and going into emergency departments because they know that they're infected with COVID. You have to understand that over the last couple of years, when we've been told that one case is important, then when people are infected by COVID now, they, th they still think that they are that one case. They don't mm. think they're one of a million cases, you know, that, that are infected with COVID at the moment. So when it's drummed into you over the last two years that COVID is this bad, awful thing, um, and all of a sudden when you're infected with COVID, you don't know kind of what to expect. Like, 
do I need to go to hospital? Do I not? Can I treat, be treated at home? There's a gap in the messaging. Um, and particularly, the, the gap is huge in remote places when people don't even know what COVID is. Mm, yeah, that is clearly the failure of, of the messaging and the, and the system to get that message out. And also, I guess, this, this shift towards living with COVID, what works in the main cities doesn't necessarily work in those remote communities. Yes, and a situation that we're seeing in the Pilbara at the moment, which, you know, as we all know, WA's border is going to be opening on the 5th of Feb and uh, they're scrambling to do everything they can. Uh, and the latest move is to stop unvaccinated people from visiting all a host of different places, um, which seems to be working. Actually, people are, are lining up to get vaccinated. But in the Pilbara, so, so WA on the 5th of Feb, they're heading for 90% double, uh, double vaxxed. They're now sitting um, at around 87% or so, so they're almost there. But in the Pilbara, for Aboriginal people in the Pilbara, they're sitting at about 36.3% double vaxxed. Mm. Just over 36% of mm. people in the Pilbara are double vaxxed Aboriginal people. So there is a, a dire situation there. And um, I'm double vaxxed. Uh, I, I still got COVID. I had very mild symptoms. Um, and what you're hearing throughout the country as COVID is sweeping through are people relieved that they are double vaxxed and some have their boosters because it leads to milder symptoms. So I had mild symptoms. I'd hate to think what my symptoms would have been if I wasn't double vaxxed. Mm. So uh, people in WA are now, um, are now scrambling just to fortify themselves for that at Feb 5 uh, opening day. And look, uh, my heart goes out to people who, who aren't ready and um, I think my message to the people in the Pilbara who have those you know generations of mistrust of government and um, and have been impacted by messages that have come in from evangelical uh, quarters just get the jab get mm. the jab it's your best chance of protecting yourself and to make sure that when COVID does come because uh, what we've seen play out in in Sydney is and Melbourne is that it is coming and Queensland and South Australia and Tasmania and the Territory it is coming for you WA get vaxxed and you, you're giving yourself the best chance of protection yeah, uh, my word, that's certainly true. I want to shift gears now uh, and go to the tent embassy in Canberra, which is turning 50 uh, just the week after next. Now, there, there have been some really confronting scenes there. And I guess one of the, the challenging points is that there, there are two distinct groups here, aren't there? There are the traditional owners and those that have been peacefully protesting at the tent embassy. And then there's this altogether other group who uh, seem to be bunking in and trying to uh, make out that they're a part of that as well. Yes, and it's very important to um, separate the two groups. And what has been amazing to see are elders coming forward, traditional owners, um, recognised elders coming forth and, uh, and, and saying these people do not represent us. Um, Dan, and you, you, you live in uh, Ngunnawal country mm. in, in Canberra. Uh, what's your take of it and, and how have you felt seeing this play out over the last couple of weeks, particularly knowing that the 50th anniversary is just around the corner? Mm. Oh, I think there's been a deliberate attempt to try and blur the lines from some of those uh, that have gathered for a whole range of other reasons. We've seen uh, some saying that they're about sovereignty, some saying that they're all about uh, anti-vaccinations or not, the, not uh, blocking and stopping the borders. But it seems to me, at least on face value, that this is very much about anarchy and about challenging the status quo around the Australian political system, whereas you're absolutely right, there are elders there from non country and other elders that are gathering saying, hold on, this is not what the Tent Embassy has ever been about. Don't try and use our name as a way to, mm. to leverage whatever point it is that you're trying to make. And I think that, that that's something that is, is, has been somewhat lost along the way as well. Mm. Yeah, and Dan, as we know, there's quite diplomacy going on behind the scenes in every sector and industry in this country um, that lead to amazing things that we see. Um, you know, like you, you, you yourself uh, use uh, the traditional words as greetings and um, at the beginning and end of all of your uh, bulletins on Nanawal country, which is fantastic. So there's things like that. That, that are just sort of done quietly that lead to huge change. And to see wanton violence undermines what the Intent Embassy stands for um, and the sorts of things that have been going on behind the scenes to, to bring about change.
Yeah, and we're likely to see or expecting to see that there to be more challenging scenes in the lead up mm. to that anniversary. And certainly, I'm sure that you're speaking to some of the elders there that were involved from the start and saying, hold on, we, we just want to be able to keep having the conversation that we're having about moving the agenda forward in a way that's respectful, not using violence, not using, uh, you know, uh, attacks or arson or any of those sorts of things as well. Yeah, uh, and and again, it, it takes the attention away from the 50th anniversary, mm. um, the 50th anniversary of, of people uh, defending their, their sovereignty and, and the fact that sovereignty was never ceded around this country. Um, so it, it is, look, what, what, I, what I think we drew, drew strength from was seeing traditional owners standing up um, against this this splintered group, um, you know, uh, and, and putting the focus back on, on what is right. Yeah, could, couldn't agree more. Narelda Jacobs from Studio 10 and 10 News First, thank you so much for your time. Wonderful to yarn with you this morning. Excellent to yarn with you too. Border, have a great day.